Let's get started. Um, firstly, good evening, everyone, um, on this night, cold spring evening. But before we kick off tonight, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. And an ever big thank you to the Chabad and to tonight's esteemed guest, David Shapiro. Tonight's discussion will be one we have all been anticipating for. And what better way to encourage an insightful discussion and to unpack our economy than to hear the views and thoughts of South Africa's, one of South Africa's top security and equity traders, David Shapiro. I know it's not necessary, as I'm sure you're all familiar with David, but I'll give you a brief introduction um, to our panelists and then we can get the ball rolling. David is a chartered accountant and an award-winning fund manager who has served on the committee of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. David is currently the deputy chairman of Sassfin Securities and can also be found speaking daily on Radio 702 and SAFM, as well as weekly on Business Day TV. Welcome, David, and thank you for the time. Just before we get started, please, if you have any questions, will you post them in the Q&A box on your screen, and Hilly and myself will do the best to get to them all. Tonight's topic, as we get the ball rolling, is we're not close to the end, we're close to a new beginning. So let's talk a bit about that, David. If you just if you give us a brief, a brief insight, I know I've given a brief introduction, but give us a brief insight into your journey and how you landed up as one of South Africa's most renowned equity analysts and traders. You want me to ask you that, to answer that straight away? <laughs> My backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on a high level, just you know, to <laughs> give those that aren't familiar. Well, well, I did my uh, I did my chartered accountancy, and uh, the day I qualified, or the day I finished the articles, I joined the stock exchange, and it took me ten years to unlearn my CA, and I've been on the market ever since. So I've, I've forty eight years, and I've done numerous things, you know, during that time. Uh, you have to keep changing. So when you say the journey, you can't. You can't apply the rules that you did then or your approach then back in 1972 um, when I joined uh, to the markets today. You've got to keep modernizing yourself and keep thinking ahead. And uh, I hope that comes across today. But um, so I've been, you know, literally, that's the only job I have ever done has been on the uh, stock market. But um, I still do it with vigor. I still get up quarter to five every morning <laughs> and uh, turn on the TV and just catch up with a half an hour of what's happening, go for a run. And even now, as we're talking, you know, when uh, on the side here, TV's still on, trying to keep up with um, where markets are. Great. You know, just as, as we, you know, having, having this discussion, what, what was your interest into the stock market, you know, from a young age? Was it always, you know, something you spurred your interest? What, what brought about that interest that you, to this day, you know, you're still exploring this, this, this industry. No, I didn't want to go to the stock market. That was the last place I ever thought I'd be. If I had my choice, I would have been uh, an architect or an artist. Um, um, that's, uh, that was my first choice. But um, when I, uh, you know, when I matriculated, I had to go to the Air Force. We were conscripted. I came out there. My father was on the ch exchange and, uh, I suppose I just saw that as a stopgap, but uh, it took me years to get into it. You know, I didn't quite enjoy it. I, I did it. I loved trading on the floor. I loved being on the floor. It was just a very exciting place to be in that. But I, but I must admit, it, it, uh, it took me a long time to get into the market and to really enjoy it. Uh, I'd still rather be an artist. I'd still rather be a cartoonist. But, um, you know, when you've got three children and you've got lots of grandchildren and you have to um, have to keep a house, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not sure art, being an artist would have played my way. Yeah. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I enjoy it. <laughs> I don't know right. whether you believe I, That's true. <laughs> that's true. Rabbi Amacinta will tell you. <laughs> well, yeah, as he said previously, the truth is what you say. Uh, um, great. Well, thanks for that, David. It sounds, it sounds like you enjoy your day-to-day -day job, and that's the most important. Um, you know, just getting back to the topic and how we, we look at the, the financial markets and, and from looking at what is referred to as a new beginning in tonight's discussion, you know, what are your thoughts on how COVID has affected the markets? And what is this new beginning that people are referring to? Has the market recovered? Do you think there'll be some further normalization? You know, what is the general outlook um, in the past six months pre-COVID, perhaps during COVID, and then maybe looking in a, in a post-COVID world, you know, just on a holistic approach. I, 
Why, why, you know, when uh, Rabbi Masinta said to me, uh, "What are you going to talk about? You know, what do you, what, what should the topic be?" And I said, uh, "Well, we're close to the end, but we're also close to a new beginning." You know, why? What I mean by a new beginning is that this is a changing event. You know, whichever way you look at it, this is going to change our lives. We're going to think differently. When we come out of here, we're going to think completely differently. We're not going to think like we did before. We, we're still going to fly. We're still going to go and eat in restaurants. We're still going to go to theater. We're still going to go to sporting events. That's not going to change. But I think we're going to be a little more conscious of the person sitting next to us or breathing down our neck or uh, a little more careful when we go into a public toilet, you know, we're going to wash our hands a little more. So, so there's going to be a whole new health regimen. There's going to be a whole new look on, on how pandemics spread and, and, and uh, issues like that. But the other thing is that when we come out of this, and when we say a new beginning, and I'll come on to that, our offices are going to be smaller. We just, you know, we suddenly realized, hold on a sec, why have we had all that space? Um, you know, a lot of these have been spoken about before as well. Um, why, why do we have to travel for business? You know, this is fun. I can communicate with you. It's great to be you with you. And there are going to be times when we've got to get together around the table. You know, I'm already finding strain in things that we're doing. For example, today, I mean, I had an IT problem, you know, to start sending me instructions, look for the little arrow here, look for that, you know, drives you mad, whereas you can just get an IT person to come in and sort it out. Um, so business travel, this is going to, it's, things are going to change. Um, you know, a lot of business models are going to be questions and old ones destroyed, new ones built. So that's, when I say the new beginning, um, I think it's going to be very exciting. I must, I, I must just think of education. You know, I was thinking of this the other day because Stadio's results came out and Cura, they're two public companies. And uh, Stadio, which is um, a tertiary education institution, was talking about digitization. You know, we're going to offer digitization. And I thought, hold on a sec. Why should I go to Stadio University? What happens if Yale or uh, University of Oxford, Oxford University, Cambridge, uh, you know, um, Harvard, any of these big Northwestern, you name these huge uh, overseas institutions, suddenly start offering me a course in the same way as I'm talking to you now. Would I rather do that? And, and you suddenly realize what brain power can be brought to us by the technology that we're using now and how that's going to change. I've been watching because I get all your uh, webinar invitations, etc. Just have a look how this has opened up your world. I'm talking to the Rolf now, you know, to Rabbi I'm say, look how it's opened up his world. You know, every night some other, you know, some other conversation taking place which people uh, are, are adhering to. So that, those are the kind of things when I say it's going to change. It's going to change, you know, uh, quite rapidly. The one thing that worries me, um, Ryan, though, on a, on a negative side, is the poor nations are going to fall behind. You know, the poor nations. Yeah. Because if they cannot afford data, if data is not ubiquitous, you know, easily available, uh, if you haven't got the machinery, if you haven't got high-speed Wi-Fi, if you haven't got um, the technology, you know, a laptop or, a, um, or, or even an iPad or something like that, you're going to fall behind. And that's the downside. That's the worrying side of this tech, you know, technological uh, fast track that we're seeing now that worries me more than anything is that the rich, and I'm talking the richer nations, are going to stream ahead of, of the poorer nations. That's a downside, but it's going to happen, and it's going to be for the poorer nations to um, to pick up. So I think, I think, in a in a in a, in a nutshell, I think um, those are the kind of things. You know, that, those are the changes that are going to have. So business are going to have to look at themselves and say, hold on a sec, what's going to happen? You know, we're surviving now. We're trying to get out of survival. That's all we're trying to do. But when we do get out of survival, will the old model still be relevant or are we going to have to change it? No, that's very interesting. David, I can't help to, you know, just spur on something you said earlier in relation to developed economies as opposed to developing economies. You know, currently, you know, we live in such a, you know, de developing country that's uh, in this inequality difference. Do you think co 
COVID is going to spur that even further um, yes. and, and cause such a huge differential between those imbalances. And then I can't help to think on an educational side as well as a corporate side, how that might affect that disparity. Um, you know, so I suppose you mentioned a lot of positives on, on a COVID, you know, having you know, non-travel and, and a lot of, you know, nice positive spins. I suppose some negatives that you have are obviously the access to information for, for these developed countries. But you know, from an educational standpoint, as, as a young businessman, young businessman myself, um, looking at an engine room or in inverted uh -huh. commas, engine room environment, you know, uh -huh. the lack of having that human interaction, especially uh -huh. for perhaps students that are in first year, second year, and aren't familiar with, with these environments of learning online. Um, do you think, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I, when I spoke about education, it's more tertiary. tertiary. It's more postgraduate, perhaps for rural people in a rural situation. You know, you're a farmer or you've got a factory out in uh, wherever in a rural area and you'd like to educate yourself and you'd like to do it. Yes, it opens up that. But for kids now, for kids, you've got to have, you need the development. You know, you, yeah, you develop you in the playground. You, you develop in the playground. Yeah. You know, I, I loved team sport. You know, if, if I'm an old man today and I'm getting on in that, but the only thing I miss about youth was playing soccer. You know, when I was, I played for Vitz, I played at a very high level and I could play three games a weekend. And I mean, even though I was, you know, I, I love to be I with you. people. I saw you an Arsenal fan. Yeah, that's a... Uh, that's that's something my dad left oh, me. Dad, that, uh, yeah, that, uh, sadly, it's 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 a curse that the family has picked up from 1927, and we can't get rid of it at the moment. So, and the more boys we have, the more it gets passed on, and the more suffering we go through. So, yeah. But um, I, I was I was I was uh, you know I enjoy playing soccer, and what I get back to is 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 it was a team sport. It was getting onto a field and knowing you're part of a team. And some days you had bad days, some days you had good days, and so on. And I think for kids, it's so important for their development to be able to, you know, that kid around in class. In fact, um, the, the, when we started with lockdown, um, we deal with a chap in, in UBS, his name is Daron Guggenheim. He's a lovely man. He's, he's been in this, he's a very, uh, you know, very religious man. And his family have been in Zurich, I think, for 300 years and everything like this. And he sent me, he showed me, it was in German, but he had a translate of his daughter, you know, what she missed about Pesach, because she had, she couldn't go to Pesach, what she missed about school. And she said that. She said, I miss kidding around in the class. In other words, with her friends. You know, they miss, they miss that. And I think it's very important that, that you have that part and we don't lose. And I think there are going to be kids who are going to, be you know left alone and suffering as a result of it, but we can't let it go. And if, the floor, I lose my time on the floor. And yeah, exactly from the floor. I suppose I you know in a trading in a trading environment, you're alone. That information mm. coming in all the time. You, you were know? never alone, and that was the best part. Was interacting with the, with the yeah. dealers. You know, you learned you learned so much so, about life. A hundred percent. I mean, I work in a relatively small fun business, and you know. Our business is obviously we we currently working remotely, but a lot of the work and a lot of the, the, the young ideas are coming from each other and bouncing off each other. And I suppose that you'll lack quite a bit. So there could be quite a bit of urgency that is stemming towards, you know, people interested or wanting to to get back to that mm -hmm. sense of normality. Yeah. It, it has to happen. You know, it, it has to happen soon. I, I, I must say there's one other thing that, you know, you know what I miss? I miss young people. And, um, you know, by being stuck here, shame, my poor wife, I mean, it's us together, we're getting on well, there's no issues, she's cooking three meals a day. But I miss the office listening to young ideas, listening to how young people think. And don't think it's not important because a lot of my, a lot of, and, and I'm saying this with a purpose, because a lot of where we invest and how we look at investments is to understand the market. You know, it's understand what they're wearing. You know, they're wearing athleisure. Nobody wears, 
the big names anymore, Hugo Boss or any of those, you know, you, you don't look like a, an Italian gigolo anymore, you know, <laughs> people are walking around in, in, in or, or, you know, ladies are walking around in their gym wear and so on. And, and you look and see what they're wearing, what they're buying. And that's how you start to formulate your views. What are they playing? You know, look at gaming. I mean, oh, gaming God. today is bigger. And, and this is important. Gaming is massive today. Tournaments are bigger. More money is spent on gaming than on, on Broadway shows or on uh, uh, you know, making movies or for Netflix or for Amazon. And yet no one ever writes up games. You, know, you never hear about it. In that. But it's a mammoth industry. So you've got to understand, what's my grandson doing? You know? and, 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 and on, on PlayStation gaming? Is that what you're referring to? Absolutely. That kind of gaming. So you learn you know, from that. Yeah. So that's how you formulate ideas, by being around other people, by being around younger people, listening to what, have a look at what phones they wear, you know, they're using, have a look what software and so on. So if you want to go into investment, you know, if you look at investment, you've got to keep your eyes open and you've got to understand what the market is saying and what the market is doing. So I miss that part of it. You know, it's very important. Very interesting. I'm just going to jump in here. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, David, it's be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. I mean, I read an article the other day, and it said two years after the Spanish flu, the world was back to normal. Yes. Everyone forgot about it, um, made out that it wasn't relevant. I'm saying, do you not think, obviously, you have your views, and people will be more concerned around hygiene, but the minute a vaccine comes out, the minute a cure comes out, um, do you not think the world just forgets okay. about this very quickly and just gets back to normal and gets on with it, we still think it will linger and live with I us. Look at the, Hilly, I look at the AIDS, AIDS uh, pandemic or the AIDS, what do you call it? Uh, yeah. It is a pandemic, yeah. People are very conscious now still, you know, of that. Uh, maybe there's not a, a vaccine, you know, or there's no yeah. cure. But, but I think, see how that has changed our attitudes towards relationships uh, with other people. So I, I think that's more referring to what I'm saying. That's why I said, we're still going to fly. We're still going to go to restaurants because we enjoy that. We still want to go to sporting events and that. But there's going to be a little more consciousness of, uh, yeah. of health. And it's going to be, the, the other thing where it's going to change as well is, is nations, countries are going to be much more health conscious, their public health systems, they're not going to be caught like this again. You know, they're yeah. going to make sure that they've got enough beds and those kind of things in the hospitals, enough nurses, you know, enough equipment. They will not be caught like this again as well. So there are many aspects that are going to change the way we think. And, you know, uh, uh, when, when, when administrations start talking about reducing the prices of drugs, you know, so that. and that's not going to happen because you need scientists, you need the research and development to, to look for cures for drugs. But uh, I wasn't around in the Spanish flu. Neither was I. <laughs> I'm old, but... <laughs> neither, neither was I. It's just an interesting theory. I'm so saying, just hmm. wonder how, I we'll guess we'll look back in two years time and see the way we live in it. We'll be able to take a view on that. I don't know if we have the answer to that, but I, but I, I think people want to get back to where they are. And if you, if you look out fast, you know, I, we, I, I look out and call it drive and you just see how the traffic is built up, etc. Yeah. And uh, just, yeah, so I, I'd love to get back to normal. It's not that I want to put a, a spoke in the wheel there, you know, I'd love to see, I'd love, to, I'd love to see us get back to that. 100%. 100%. Are there any other? Um, Great. Okay, well, I'm carry on. Sorry, just be on the topic of uh, on the topic of com on the topic of education. I see a question has just come through. Yeah, maybe we should stick to it before we jump on. She says, "Hi, David." And I'm sorry for jumping around. She says, "Hi, David. Would you recommend doing a CFA if you are currently a chartered accountant who would like to enter into the equity markets?" If you are a chartered accountant, that's number one. Okay, and I'll I'll, you, I'll tell you why. Yes. Because when you're a chartered accountant, you like to you, you you go behind the scenes. In other words, you write up the accounts, you do the auditing, you know, you get into the business and you understand how the business operates. 
And, and, and I'm going to say one thing as well. I hope you're a chartered accountant at a very small firm because uh, when you're at a small firm, you do the entire audit, you know, and you understand how businesses operate, uh, which is a very, you know, you understand how people buy things, you know, how the buyer works, how you cost, you know, um, how you, your inventory levels. There's so many elements that you learn about a business as a chartered accountant. As a CFA, you only look at accounts once they've been produced. So you never really get behind the scenes. So for me, I value chartered accountants more because they understand credit. They understand the granting of credit. They understand the liquidity of a business and, and, and the problems that businesses go through. When you're a CFA, it's the other way around. You know, you become a, a uh, certified account, uh, whatever it is, financial, uh, financial analyst. analyst. And, and yeah, and it, that teaches you derivatives. It teaches you all these instruments of mass destruction, you know, these uh, all the different ways of uh, gearing yourself up and exploding the whole financial world. You know, so um, there, 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 there's, a, there's a lovely story. I've written, I've written a story for... Um, for um, Stan Smuckler's Rosh Hashanah magazine. And uh, it's, it, you know, in my day, in Rabbi Masinta's day, in the olden days, all the clever people used to become lawyers, they became scientists, they became doctors, you know, those are, they became professors. The bottom end of the class, they went to the insurance companies and they joined the stock market and they were quite content. People would phone and they would give good advice and they did their job honestly and etc. Then came the internet and then came and all of a sudden you realize, hold on a sec, you know, markets are changing. They're now electronic markets. You know, we can now program them. We can introduce algorithms. And suddenly all those scientists decided to come and join the stock market. And that's what happened. That's how we got 2000. That's how we got 2007, 2008. It was all those algorithms that absolutely bombed. So we're saying, listen, clever boys, go back to being scientists now. Go find cures for COVID-19. You know, go find cures for that. Leave the markets to the schmucks, you know, to the bottom end. Oh, not, so, not so easier for them. And, and, and David, you just touched it. Algorithmic trading. Um, yeah. I think it's becoming more prominent. Um, yes. today's term is saying, is that going to remove the need for stockbrokers? Is that going to remove the need for picks? Um, what's your view on this? Uh, and how successful are they? It's very interesting. It, it, you know, markets have gone through a complete metamorphosis. They're completely yeah. different. When I joined in 72, we had a lot of private clients. The whole, the whole structure was different. People would phone us up and we'd give them advice over the phone and so on. So it was made up of a lot of people who were involved in the market. It's changed so dramatically. It's a big subject and it's very difficult to cover it in a, in, in a very sh short time. But it's important today, 80, 90% of the markets are driven by algorithmic trading. By computers, by computers looking for wow. a little bit. Uh, yeah, wow. it's so the market that I wow. knew doesn't exist anymore. You know, it's very, very small. Um, there's enough of a market to, to to enable me to make a living. Just look at the, you know, in when I joined, there was no unit trust. The first unit trust came in the late late 1960s. That's, in fact, I think they just introduced when I when I joined the market today. They're more unit trust, they're more ETFs, they're more products or passive products than there are shares on the market. But and they serve a role. You know, they they they, they serve a very important role. But um, markets are becoming extremely complicated. You know, there are so many different derivatives around each kind of product and uh, that you have to specialize in those kind of products you know you can't be what i am almost a uh, uh, jack of all trades you know i like to cover markets because i enjoy it but the warren buffets are, are i don't want to call him a dinosaur but those kind of investors are are becoming you know almost uh, dinosaurs that kind of approach, etc. It is so specialized and so and so big. And remember, it's 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 global. You know, um, I, I I very seldom trade on the JSE today. You know, we're um, we're hooked up. I can sit here now 
and with New York open and I can deal in New York and literally at the press of a button. So it's, it's changed dramatically, but, but algorithmic trading is massive today, massive, massive. And the huge amounts of money behind it are just ginormous, gigantic. Wow. You know, even the JSE, there are, um, if, if, if you monitor like I do volumes every day, there's a lot of balancing that takes place in the last 10 minutes. In many cases, a third of the trade on the JSE takes place in the last 10 minutes of trade. You know, it's, it's balancing the ETFs and, and doing all those trades. You know, there's nothing sinister about it. It's just the way markets work today. And David, where is South Africa in this algorithmic, you know, journey? We, you know, we we we're losing our momentum. You know, we're we're not as big as as we used to be. I think there are a number of reasons. Um, our market is getting smaller and 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 smaller all the time. You know, uh, um, if you if you look at the composition of the JSC, um, Naspers, Prosus, uh, some of the big companies, British American Tobacco, ABM Bev. Uh, Richmond, and none of those do business in South Africa, make up 50% of the market in a handful of shares. So all those businesses that we talk about that you see, um, you know, that, that you come face to face with in your daily life, etc., count very little for the market. It's, uh, so it's made up of, you know, it's made up of the huge international. Sorry? You're saying it's highly concentrated. Very concentrated. Right. So if you look at the JSC, if you look at the uh, all share index or top 40 index, it, it's made up of a handful of shares that, uh, that, that, that dominate, you know, process uh, that's NASPERS, which is 10 cent. Um, so, so it leaves very little margin for smaller businesses. What's happened as well, it's, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy because um, just going back to when I joined, uh, we were the resource capital of the world in those days. We, you know, there were 40 different gold mines listed, numerous diamond mines and uh, coal mines and platinum mines and mining houses and, and industrial businesses, furniture manufacturers, clothing manufacturers, blanket, you know, you name it, textile. So we had a much broader uh, market, much, much broader market without any clear dominance. Anglo-America was a big firm, but, but that's changed. You know, that's, it, it, it's global as well. You know, there's moans and groans today about the, about the power of the big tech, of the fangs, you know, of, of what influence they're having on the market. It's nowhere near as pronounced as, as, as it is here um, in, in South Africa. But the JSE, the JSE is, 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 is losing its muscle. So on that note, you know, I'd like to pick up on that discussion. Um, you know, we've seen a large amount of volatility um, in both a positive and negative direction. Mm -hmm. Just to revert back to, you know, um, as a result of COVID. Um, from a positive perspective, we, you know, we saw the likes of international businesses, as you've mentioned, Amazon, Google, the Fangs, mm -hmm. Apple, uh, Netflix, um, you know, taking off and these online businesses really kicking off during this period. Mm -hmm. You know, can you explain why there's such a disconnect in the American stock market to the economic reality? You know, stock markets perhaps at a pre-COVID levels, but unemployment at such a high, you know, perhaps relating it to somewhat of a South African context, you know, how does that it, in the stock yeah, no, it's, a, it's a lovely thought. It's a lovely, and, and you know, I always say, hold on a sec. Five months ago, we were worried because the market was collapsing. Now we're worried because the market's too high. I'm saying, listen, I'd rather be rich and worried than poor and worried. You know, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Yeah, the markets go. And you're learning a lesson now. You're learning a very important lesson in, in markets, you know, as they go. Why are they going up? Look, there are a number of reasons. People are, first of all, we're very resilient. We're incredibly resilient people. So we now start to... Can you hear? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You're sure. saying no, very no. resilient as a country or just generally? No, 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 generally, people are resilient. So they're, you know, they soon start to move or shift their thoughts more to uh, the cures than the infection rates. We don't worry about deaths anymore. Okay, so it's very important. What's also happening now is that 
as economic activity starts to come back, so we're starting to see it come through in the numbers. We're seeing employment pick up. Yes, might be, and I'm talking globally, okay? It might be at a very slow pace or a slower pace. It's erratic, it's patchy, but it's moving in the right direction. It's going in the right direction. Um, we are getting towards a cure. There's no doubt that a cure is going to come. There, there must be, I don't know how many different uh, vaccinations that are being in, in preparation at the moment. You know, we all the time we're reading about it, cures, doctors are getting on top of it, we're learning a little bit more. So there's all that. Plus, there's governments. The governments, they imposed this. Remember, uh, this, is, this, this crisis that we're seeing now is not a financial crisis, this is a health crisis. Countries locked down. We've never seen that before. We've never seen a country lock down its economy. So um, the government had to ensure that those innocent people whose business was stopped get through this gap. In other words, that there's a bridge for them to get through. Plus, they've got to ensure when the economies come back that there's enough stimulus to keep this momentum going. So we've seen massive amounts of stimulus being introduced by governments, you know, as uh, you know, particularly the U.S. But it's not only them. Uh, bazookas have been fired by the U uh, Europeans. They've been fired by every nation, uh, even South Africa. Although ours is probably a pea shooter relative to to uh, some of the other heavy weapons. Jay Powell last week, on the, on the weekend or just before, I think it was Friday or Thursday or Friday. He gave his speech at Jackson Hole, which was a, it's an annual symposium, although this time it was virtual. And it's, it's for geeks. It's for central bank geeks together. They discuss all things that we don't quite understand. But the message that came from Jay Powell was that, and I'm, and I'm summarizing without going through the full detail, interest rates are going to remain low for a long time. They're going to remain very low for a long time. So you've got zero interest rates. You know, it's bad on savers, and, and we can go into this because it's going to affect the way that people look at their investments, particularly those who are conscious of getting a return. You know, the traditional way, I put 40% into bonds and property and everything, and I put 60 that's gone. But the point is that with interest rates at zero, okay, let's take the long bond rate in the United States, and, and it's important. The long bond rate is trading at 0.7%. So you can buy a 10-year bond at 0.7, not even 1%, 0.7. Inflation, call it 1.7, just for ease of reference. It means you're getting a negative return of 1%. So by holding it, you're actually losing money. You know, your money is losing its value. So in a situation like that, people, rather than going into a, a um, uh, a security that gives you a negative rate, you know, where you're losing money, but rather say, hold on a sec, if I look at Facebook, you know, if I look at Google, um, um, Alphabet, if I look at these businesses, they're generating huge returns. They're generating, they're growing their businesses a double digit. I would rather pay more for $1 earnings then go and put a dollar into, uh, you know, then go and buy a bond. So that's where the shift has come. And that's why equity markets are likely to continue going up as long as rates remain where they are, you know, in, in the low area. So can I, can I just jump in there? So uh, what up, happens okay. now when the rates do spike? Yeah. Perfect. I think you summed it up extremely well. And then I think what happens I'm saying when the rates do spike, because they say it's going to be a Jacob. So interest yep. rates are going to remain low for as long as possible. But then when it does kick, it's going to kick hard. So what happens, I'm saying, yeah. what we happens then? It's a good question. No, it's a very good thought. Because uh, when inflation, you see what Jay Powell said, they, when inflation goes above their target of 2%, generally what happened, they start to raise rates. In 215, 216, that caused a, a massive wobble in markets. And what he said in his speech is, we're not going to be too quick to act. You know, we'll, we'll absorb it. We'll average it out. So now what markets are going to watch very carefully for is the inflation rate. They do want, America wants a bit of inflation. And we, you know, we could go into that as well. Why, why do you want inflation? Because uh, 
uh, you know, prices go up as prices go up, more people buy, blah, blah, because they fear their prices are going to go up, so they continue to buy, which is the opposite of deflation. When you think prices are going to fall, you don't want to buy, so economic activity stops. But the point is that will happen, and we hope it does happen, that inflation starts to... What is inflation? Inflation is there's greater demand than supply. That's all it is. You know, look, there's, there are other kinds of inflation where a price goes up of a metal, you know, which might be artificial and it causes kind of inflation like the oil price. Yeah. But broadly, inflation is there's, there's more demand than supply. And I think that's where governments would like to go to, where we absorb the excess capacity in, in, in markets. And, and uh, you know, we absorb the excess capacity that there is through demand, you know, through spending, through consumerism get economies back on their uh, road. So we pray for the day that rates do start to go up. And for savers, I mean, it's absolutely imperative. I'm saying, I mean, I agree. But looking at this African context, it's like mm. interest rates are so at all-time low, and you've got people now purchasing properties just based on the fact that interest rates are low and property yields are 13 or a great interest rate. You've got the yield of credit effect. What happens if the interest rates kick then? then can that lead to no, no, a mini housing crisis, a mini property bubble? In South Africa, we've got a different situation. It's a completely different situation in, uh, in South Africa. Here, uh, the yield curve is very, very steep. So in America, there is no yield curve, it's flat. <laughs> you know, um, if you've got money and you put it in deposit, uh, they pay you. <laughs> I mean, they don't pay you, you pay them. You pay them. So, you pay them you know, to put your money away. So, so you've got zero rates. And, and as I said, 10 years, if you put your money away for 10 years, you get 0.7%. I mean, it's crazy. So that's your yield curve. It, it, it's totally flat. It's non-existent. It's non-existent in Japan. It's non-existent in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and yields are going to be very low. South Africa is a different situation. Our yield curve is very steep. And why? That's because of the economic situation. They're fierce. So on the short end, if you put your money on call, you probably get three, three and a half percent. The long end, that's where rates are 10, 20 years. I think the I think the 10-year yield today was 9.1, 9.2, which has come down a little. And the 20-year is about 11 and a half. So in fact, that's a very good. What we're recommending at the moment for clients is to go that 20 year, you know, because we think that yields will come down and that you will make, you know, without, you'll make the capital profit. So you're getting 11% paid by government. You know, even if you do pay full tax on it, it's still not a bad return. So we're in a slightly different position. Hitty, where what worries us is why aren't foreigners coming in? You know, with such attractive yields here, there's still a fear that our debt position is untenable and that it's going to get worse and that rates will go up. So there's still a fear of South Africa's uh, economic position at the moment. So there's still that fear of, 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 you know, of where we are in the economy. You know, we are shrinking. We've got a lot of issues here. So from South Africa, you have to distinguish it from the rest of the world. Property, you know, you were talking about our market. Our uh, property as well is, 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 that becomes a factor of property because of our economic issues here. You know, we were already in recession before this uh, lockdown hit us. And all that has done is taken us, you know, further down. Our debt has gone up through the roof. So we're in a, we're in a difficult situation now, very, very difficult. That's going to take a number of years uh, for us to, to work through. And, and, and the property has been particularly hard hit for a number of reasons. Number one, the reason that, that, that uh, there was lockdown, you know, it, it caused a huge, huge issues with tenants. Um, so there are a number of things that have converged uh, to make, you know, property, uh, put property. Property shares on the JSC this year, um, down 50, 60, 70 percent. Mm. And do you, and just to touch on property, I'm saying if somebody offered you the opportunity to buy the physical asset at a 70% at a 70 discount, you would probably jump on that. If you could buy the likes of Sandton City or Waterfront at a 70% discount, you'd buy that. Do you still think REITs are a player, a long-term player in this country? Long-term. But you don't have to go in now. <laughs> you know, in other words, you, yeah, you can, you, you, you've got the uh, luxury of waiting out. You know, 
it, it's too early. You, you, you don't, you can wait and you wait for things to turn and you wait for science to emerge that things are turning better, even if you miss the first few percentage points. And that's why don't, don't, don't be, don't rush. You know, I always use the expression and we're seeing it now. I, I wish I could show some charts on that, but bottoms are made over time, not a price. So we might be at the bottom, but it goes over time. It goes like this and it builds a base. And the stronger and longer that base, the more it's going to bounce off it. So let that base form. You know, and there's still plenty of time to take advantage of these of these companies. I must tell you, I'm very surprised because I look at businesses and I see bricks and mortar businesses that that were once the substructure of the JSE of the whole South African economy, trading at ridiculously low levels. You know, if I look at the Tongods and the Hulemans and the Nampex and the Togo Suns, the Sun Internationals, I can name, you know, many, many more companies and they're trading less than a billion rand. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I think, I think Sun International is three billion rand. That's, think of the property at, um, you know, in Pilansburg, whatever it is, it, it's crazy. But don't be in a rush. You know, just wait. You, you, you've got them earmarked. It's a, it's a pin in your head, you know what I mean? You just say, it, it, you, you put a pin in it, wait. Just wait for conditions to start to alter. And, and even if you miss it, you'll get, you'll get plenty of opportunity. Do investors have that confidence to, to, to sit around waiting? You know? They haven't got patience to me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's number one. Just, yeah, you, you don't have to be impatient. Just be patient. It's, uh, you know, you can sit for months doing nothing. Don't, don't always, you know, you don't have to be the first in. Just sit there and relax. Put your money away, put it elsewhere, and, and you'll get plenty of opportunities. See, there's lots of comments coming through here around Bitcoin. You say, put no, your money no. elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Is that something you put your money in? I, you know, I don't understand it. <laughs> That's a, if, if I understood it, you know, I'd put my money there, but I, I, I don't understand it. I don't even get past the first uh, chapter, you know, when I start to read about it. So for the moment, um, if, if, you, if you've got the compulsion, you know, you can buy gold if you want. And I'm not a gold bull, believe me. I'm not a gold bull. But uh, uh, with zero interest rates, the cost of holding gold, and it, uh, I, I also watch headlines. There's another thing that you must watch if you want to learn. Watch it, listen to headlines, you know, read what the headlines are saying. So if everybody's saying buy gold, buy gold, buy gold, you know, and they're all fund managers say, well, okay, I'm going to buy gold because um, whatever it is. So, um, you know, for whatever reason. Um, but I don't understand. But I, I must say um, blockchain, Bitcoin, down the line, there will be a place for it. You know, I'm not dismissing it, by no means dismissing it. I'm saying that that, that kind of technology, that's, it's, it's, uh, it will be used, it will find its place. You know, at the moment, um, we don't quite understand it. So, you know, from my point of view, at my age, I leave it to the youngsters. So I'm sure at the SATA table that will Bitcoin has be discussed for the last whatever, you know, so if there is a SATA table. I hope so. 2021. <laughs> you can bet they're going to talk about the market. Yeah. 20, 20, 2021, that's our goal is to get back to the yeah. SATA table. Hmm. David, I've got a question on a, on a, on a you know, more interest, personal side. You know, we're chatting about crypto and it's more the alternative sphere. What are your thoughts on you know alternative investments in this equity market that we're looking at? Are, you know, are investors seeking that sort of growth and, and that yeah, you know, hedge funds and, and these sort of alt alt. You know, you know what I find um, trading is difficult. <laughs> trading is you know why? Because you take you taking on a sophisticated computer that that can think, uh, I, can't, I can't give you a mathematical equation of how fast it thinks and how fast it can process data. That's what you're taking on in the world of hedge funds. You know? and, and it's, I, I, I'm not sure that on balance, I'm not talking about one or two, that there's a huge profit to be made there. 
you know, in, in hedge funds. There's some very smart traders. Uh, what, where the difference is, is that, you know, between us and them, I'm a long only, you know, I just buy things. If I don't, if I, you know, if, I, if, if something's too expensive, I don't want to go, I just go into cash and I sit back. I don't go short because short is finite, you know, uh, is, sorry, is, you know, if you buy something at 100, you can only get it, it, it could go down to zero. If you buy it, if you buy it, sorry, if you sell it at 100, it can go down to zero, you can make a profit. If you buy it at 100, it can go to 1,000 as we've seen with Tesla, as we've seen with Zoom, as we've seen Zoom went up 30% today, I think. It's up 500% since the beginning of the year. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. Now, Tesla is just not far behind as well. But trading is exceptionally difficult. It, it, it's, it's too difficult for me, you know, and, and that's why I prefer just to select 20, 25 good companies that, you know, that's all my, if you had to say, what do you say to a client? When a client comes to me, I've got the one, and, you know, all I say is I'm going to buy you the best 20, 25 companies in the world. That's it. That's all I do. And well, you say, why are you so arrogant that you know which the best 25 companies? Well, uh, you know, they're the 25 I like, you know, and, and, and we do our research. We look at the themes. We like those businesses. And that's all we do. You know, and, and if you're going to buy something, you must be committed to it. You know, you either like it or you don't like it. So you either buy 5% or you buy zero. You know, go buy, I'm going to have a half a percent in. What's the use? You know, um, it, it, it makes no sense. So do your homework, know your companies, commit. When it doesn't fulfill what you bought it for, sell it. And I don't, in other words, sometimes you do buy companies that you think are going to do certain things. They don't get there, sell it. You know, you don't have to hang around and wait. You know, egos also gets in the way of a lot of people, you know, because they don't want to admit that they did something wrong or got it wrong. So they hang around until it really kills them. You know, as soon as it, as soon as you feel, hold on, this is not why I bought it, Just go. It doesn't matter the bookkeeping you do in your head. No one cares about the bookkeeping. <laughs> From a, you know, like a metric perspective, you know, if someone is an investor or someone looking to invest into the stock exchange in a pre-COVID, post-COVID or currently yeah. at the moment, you know, what metrics or what would you advise, you know, um, people to look at when approaching these investments or these companies? I, I use, uh, how do you choose a girlfriend? On, on the looks. <laughs> okay. Do, do, you, do you get a spreadsheet? <laughs> you got to choose it based on... What's your two? <laughs> you do a spreadsheet. You say, listen, she says, hey, her mom's good looking, her dad's got money, you know what I mean? <laughs> you, you don't do that. It's chemistry. That's what attracts you. And to buy businesses is chemistry. You've got to understand the business and you've got to watch it for a long time and build that relationship. It's not a matter of filling out a spreadsheet or doing the metrics. Eventually, you'll understand the metrics. Once you understand the business, the metrics come. You know, you ask yourself about the business. What does it do? What does it sell? Where is it going to be three, four, five years? Is the product that it's making sustainable? Is it dominant or is it going to be competitive? You know, is there a lot of competition in it? And, and, and so you go through a spreadsheet. More important is management. Why is management there? You know, is it, uh, are they there for themselves to make money or are they there for the business to build a legacy? Man, you know, what a, understand how management acts. You know, are they interested in you? Are they interested in their staff? Are they interested in customers? So those things come through time, only through time and through reading and meeting. Man I mean, you know, you can meet management in a presentation or something like that. So, so it's much more important to build that relationship. That's why I never touch a company that comes to the market straight away. You know, just don't touch it. And, and, and simply because you don't know the people involved. It takes time to understand whether you can rely on what they say, you know, when they come out and so on, and whether you can buy their balance sheet on the corner. You know, because believe me, I'm in a CA. I, we know tricks, boy. You know, it's a matter of, as you say, and have you seen today accountancy is a big fraud because I'm going on, at, I'm a bit of a tirade at the moment about all the write-offs and write-downs and, uh, you know, the impairments, et cetera, because you just do a journal entry and you hide all your mistakes. So um, I, I'm in a, you know, I'm a bit of a issue at the moment. 
Um, so, but you've got to understand businesses. You've you've got to build that relationship and 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 uh, you know, understand and feel trust about them. Yeah, makes sense. I think I'll, I'll jump in, Ryan, if you don't mind. And David, it's a it's a statement made. I think by Stephen Costa, and I'm sure a lot of other people have said, "Never waste a good craft." I think it was Winston Churchill who first said it. I can't remember the top of my head. Um, you know, never waste a good crisis, and uh, I'm sure there are a lot of opportunities, and I'm sure people are, yeah. and people have made some money in these difficult times. Those people and those businesses that work here to fulfill the need of COVID, do you think it's sustainable? Do you think they're still going to look at the likes of Zoom, um, the likes of these other businesses that have done extremely well? Um, how sustainable do you think it really is in the post-COVID world? And then again, in what sectors would you recommend people look okay. at, you know, for opportunities yeah. and in a private capacity and in a listed space? I, th I think the digital economy that was already in place before COVID hit us has just been accelerated. You know, just think of us, just think of me here touching buttons and talking to you. I never knew this before we started. We've learned a lot of skills. And what's happened is it's forced clients and customers and people to upgrade their skills in technology. Suddenly, what was a obstacle is no longer an obstacle. Or what was a barrier to entry is no longer a barrier to entry. So it's, it's, it's opened up a lot of things in a lot of worlds. The digital economy, um, we're going to get a period when the vaccine is becomes ubiquitous, it's, uh, all, you know, everybody gets it, and we get back to normal life, you're going to find a little bit of rotation out of tech stocks back into those stocks that were ignored, the leisure stocks, the airline stocks, the banks, uh, some of the energy companies and so on. That will be short-lived. The digital economy that we know is going to continue. All the companies that we are buying, you know, whether it's Amazon and so on, are going to continue. They are so powerful. They are so big. They've got so much money that they can maintain their dominance. I know everybody wants to break them up. But where I'm getting to is that there's a next movement coming. So that's still going to continue because of where we are, the streaming, the gaming, the entertainment. That momentum is only gathering pace now, and it's not going to stop. The next is 5G, and that's a game changer. 5G is a game changer. The headlines today were that Apple have uh, told their suppliers you know, that they want 75 to 80 million, I think, 5G phones. When you get a 5G phone, you might delay for a year, you might hang. This is not 4G plus one. 5G is not 4G plus one, it's 5G, which is you know, the transmission of, of, of data at a, you know, at a rate significantly faster. Now we can only, only when we got 5G can we have autonomous cars. Can we have, you know, the uh, tech medicine where you can um, do operations where it can just process that. all these kind of things that are going to come in. The Internet of Things, factories that are thinking, you know, artificial intelligence. So we're going in to another phase of tech development, which is going to hit us in the next two, three, four, five, six years as well. As, you know, so this movement we're seeing now is only going to gather momentum. The cigarette companies, the, the booze companies, you know, all of those are going to fall by the wayside as they struggle to get the kind of dominance that they used to get, the branding power. That's because of the internet, you know, there's just so many more products now that those companies we knew are just going to fall, fall away. So I'm saying that this is, you know, when we talk about this, uh, you know, it's the start of a new economy. Uh, this is going to go on for a long time. You know, this is this is just going to gather momentum as technology improves. And we haven't even touched medical technology, you know, which is just, uh, and, and it's not necessarily a cure for COVID. It's just the kind of machinery that's going to come, uh, you know, with technology. So, I, 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 you know, for young people like yourselves, um, I think there's just wonderful opportunities, you know, to get on this bandwagon, to get onto this train, um, and, 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 and benefit and, you know, skill in that kind of area. Yeah. You, the jobs of the future will be interesting. Mm. That's for sure. I think, uh, just make sure you, your kids, 
make sure you put your kids there, you know. Don't well, let them that. become... Mm. Don't let no. them become accountants like us. Accountants, sure. <laughs> become, become redundant. <laughs> We're not going to be needed in the future. Give them a bit of, a bit of anxiety. <laughs> yeah, no. uh, David, I mean, I could chat to you for hours and it's been absolutely inspirational. I think there's one more question yeah, just before we got to end off and it's just relevant to us saying, you know, that why is the RAND strengthening and is it sustainable? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the RAND strengthening because the dollar is weakening. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> it's got, you know, we try and correlate it to a whole lot of things because all those, all those past correlations are gone. You know, um, where gold went up, the rand would go, you know, it's just been all over the place. But you'll track it to the dollar. The dollar's under a lot of pressure at the moment. And it, it wasn't under pressure. You know, when COVID started, when lockdown started, everybody f fled to the dollar. You know, we pushed the dollar up. Um, now what's happening is things are easing and also interest rates in the U.S. are coming down and people are feeling better about other areas of the market. The dollar is starting to unravel a bit. I wouldn't back against the dollar. You know, I wouldn't get too carried away, but I see the euro is about 120 and it's picked up from where it was, the pounds picked up and so on. And the rand is, uh, is kind of picking up. But we've got a lot of issues here. You know, South Africa has got a lot of our, our debt. Our debt uh, levels are increasing. You know, it's becoming uh, more, our, our, our growth rate is falling. So um, against that, it's, you know, we're facing quite a few hardships here. So I wouldn't, the RAND can improve if, if global markets do continue on the path. The RAND can you know, improve quite dramatically. Remember, we were 14 at 1st of January, eh? 40 to the dollar. Oh. You know, we're now about 16, I don't know, 70, 16, 80. So we're down about 20% since the beginning of January. So, so there is, there's quite a bit of margin for us to improve. But I think over time, um, I, I think the the weakening bias will continue. But um, it's, it's purely the dollar. It's those algorithms, you know, because it, it is an algorithm. Messing up everything. Yeah. yeah. When the dollar goes down, you know, the RAM goes up. No one, you, we, we all think that they're clever chaps sitting on desks in fancy offices, you know, all over the world that are looking at our politics and understanding what Cyril's saying and, and the Zoom issues. Nah, they don't care. It's got enough. They don't care. For them, it's, a, it's, it's they just, just a the arbitrage. Mm, it's a, yeah, it's a mathematical they, equation. They advantage of the arbitrage. Absolutely right. You know, so don't put too much intellectual right. intelligence on all these chats. And they're all CFAs. So. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a comment for our viewer. He might have changed his view. You can't end up like that. I mean, Dave, I think we've run out of time. Like I said, okay. I said we could actually have to talk for hours. And it's really, really been inspirational and just insightful. And I already got one or two messages just from some viewers to say thank you for this evening. Thank you for hosting it. And thank you to you. So, Thank you very much for your time. I mean, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure Ryan has and all our viewers. And it's really a privilege and honor to have you on tonight. And hopefully we'll be able to do it sometime soon again. With pleasure. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. So thank you. Thank and, you. To, and to the role who's probably sloughing there behind the picture. Huh? <laughs> absolutely not. I'm listening <laughs> absolutely <laughs> with open ears here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay. Amazing. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.